So as Manuel says, introduction, what I want to be um, spending the next 40 minutes or a bit less, maybe given the time talking about, is when it's appropriate or maybe required to engineer uh, concepts and whether properties like lack of clarity, vagueness, and confusion give you a reason, maybe a proto, a protento reason to engineer uh, concepts. And I will be uh, focusing today exclusively on scientific uh, concepts. So bracketing entirely the question of non-scientific concepts. Um, so the issue, as I just already hinted, is whether uh, is to try to address the following question: When should uh, conceptual engineers uh, reform existing concepts? And when you ask this question, the answer seems to be obvious. The answer is well, when those concepts are deficient. So uh, a conceptual engineer should reform uh, deficient concepts. But of course, that answer pushes the debate only one step further. The next question is obviously, when are concepts deficient? What makes a given concept a deficient concept? What we would want in uh, many ways are properties of concepts. Um, for example, maybe lack of clarity, vagueness, or confusion that intrinsically on their own, independently of the context of use of the concept, make concepts deficient. And as a result, at least pro tanto, make them in need of engineering. Right? And, and so the question is going to be, are there such properties? And more precisely, are clarity, vagueness, and confusion the type of properties that make concepts intrinsically deficient? Uh, and as a result, give us a pro tanto reason to engineer them. As I mentioned earlier, for, the, for various uh, reasons, I will be uh, focusing on scientific uh, concepts. One of the reasons I will be focusing on scientific concepts is because the notion of explication, which is often for me the starting point of discussion, was originally for, uh, formulated by Carnap in the context of uh, developing concepts useful for science. Uh, maybe a better reason is that um, there are actually a host of very well developed case studies in the history and philosophy of science that help us think through some of, of this question. And uh, earlier, looking at who was attending, I saw that uh, Neto uh, uh, wrote one of the nice case studies bearing on today's topic was in, in the audience. Um, Scientific concepts are also a good target because I believe it is fair to say that there is a common presumption or assumption that good scientific concepts are clear, sharp, and precise. Right? That it's a mark of good scientific thinking to develop concepts that have sharp boundary, that have uh, 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 determinate implications, and that don't confuse the phenomena they are about. So that's a really a good reason to focus on them. On the other hand, I think it's very clear that in science, many scientific concepts are none of these things. Many scientific concepts are not clear. Many scientific concepts are vague, and many scientific concepts are confused. It's also, uh, I think, plausible, and I, I will argue with many other people, I mean, the, the thoughts here aren't fully original, I would argue that the state of affairs, the lack of clarity, the lack of sharpness, and lack of precision, or the confusion of scientific concept is not an accident. Um, it's actually, it might be functional in, in science, at least in some research context. And the third point is that often scientists don't seem to mind. Scientists are fully aware of the lack of clarity, the lack of sharpness, the vagueness, the confusion of some of their concepts, and they just don't mind. They just live with these uh, properties of their concept. So here we have, so that's one of the reasons why also scientific, case, scientific concepts always so seem to be a good case study, right? There's a presumption, uh, I think a naive, an intuitive, and a, a widespread, as we see, presumption that good scientific concepts are clear, sharp, and precise. But the real world of science don't seem to be uh, um, so easily uh, amenable to this presumption. All right, uh, that was a justification about why I'm focusing on scientific concepts uh, today. The take home message uh, of this uh, 
uh, new project uh, is that there is at least presumably no intrinsic property that renders scientific concepts deficient. So deficiency of a scientific concept is not um, um, uh, uh, grounded in any intrinsic property. And apparent deficiencies, such as vagueness or confusion, can in fact contribute to the success of a scientific concept. So then they are not going to render the scientific concepts deficient. Uh, and the second point I, want, I will be arguing in the last section of this lecture is that it turns out to be extremely difficult to determine when a scientific concept happens to be deficient and as a result calls for a scientific, uh, uh, calls for conceptual engineering. Extremely difficult does not mean impossible, of course, but means really quite challenging. And uh, at least at this point, when we look at the history of, of science, it's not clear whether scientists, when they are fully uh, immersed in the scientific research, can really be in a good position to determine whether a scientific concept should be engineered or not. And that will uh, 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 give rise to a new challenge to uh, conceptual engineering. All right, that's uh, the take home message for this lecture. Here's a structure of, of the talk. I will first describe what I call the Canadian ideal. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm no historian of philosophy, and my Canap is always a uh, sort of Canap. So it's a reconstruction, a convenient foil, I would say. Um, and against this ideal, I will describe uh, the scientific success of unclear, va vague, and confused concepts. Here, relying on the work done by historians and philosophers of science, mostly historians and philosophers of biology. Uh, and then I will talk about why such concepts that seem deficient by the, uh, the light of the Canadian ideal turns out to be successful. What is it, what is it, what is it about them? That explains why we science often need such concepts. And then we're going to be concluding that there is no intrinsic property, that whether a concept is deficient is always a relational property of concept. It's, it depends on the concept and its context of use, namely the scientific context, the research context. And the worry there is that it's going to be it's 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 extremely opaque when a scientific context. Uh, require when the scientific context require um, uh, the improvement of um, 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 uh, uh, a scientific concept. All right, so the structure of this talk. Let's start with uh, um, the Canadian ideal. As I always do when I talk about conceptual engineering, let me start. Uh, with uh, Canap's notion of explication. There's a lot to be said, of course, about Canap here. Uh, as uh, all of you know, um, the notion was most uh, developed in most detail in the, chapter, in the first chapter of the Logical Foundations of Probability in 1950. And the idea here is that explicating a concept consists in reforming it often, but not always, Canap is clear about that, so often formally existing, often led concepts, so that's the example that Canap gives, to make them useful for scientific purposes. And what useful uh, means depends on the scientific concept. As you all know, uh, Canap himself applied his methodology to concepts such as probability and confirmation, which took to be lay concepts in need of a formal reform. Uh, uh, another of Canap's pet example, as you know, is uh, uh, Tusky's work on the concept of, of truth. Here, is, here are Canap's own words at the, at the beginning of uh, chapter, uh, at the beginning of chapter one. By an explication, we understand the transformation of an inexact pre-scientific concept, the explicandum, into an exact concept, the explicator. The explicator must fulfill the requirement of similarity to the explicandum, exactness, fruitfulness, and simplicity. And this four property are the four benchmarks or success criteria for an explication. So what are the targets of explication? For Canab. Uh, well, in, in that chapter, Canab is very clear that he thinks that uh, uh, concepts that have one of the three properties are the target of explication. Confused concepts, unclear concepts, and vague concepts are those concepts that are in need of explication. And at least one of the four success criteria I just mentioned, namely exactness, 
addresses these properties of, of, of deficient concept. An exact concept is not going to be vague, it's going to be sharp, it's of course not going to be unclear, and possibly, uh, not necessarily, but possibly it might not be concrete. So what, what do we mean or what do I mean by clarity, vagueness, and also it should be confusion here on top of the screen and not imprecision. What do I mean by uh, this uh, notion? Let me just define them for the sake of clarity in these lectures, even if scientists are al allowed to be <laughs> unclear, vague, and confused. Let's try not to be unclear, vague, and uh, confused in our discussion. A concept such as keep is vague if and only if there are some objects such that it is neither true nor false that they fall under it. Uh, there's much more to be said, but we'll leave it at that today. A concept is unclear if and only if there are some propositions such as it's indeterminate whether they follow from its application or whether its application follows from them being accepted. So we conclude that something is an X. It's, an, it's indeterminate what follows from that for some propositions. And we've concluded that some proposition hold it's indeterminate whether or not um, um, uh, 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 something is an X. All right, and the concept is obscure. I think that the way I understand that notion, if and only if it fails to distinguish different phenomena. So obscurity is a, mat is a matter of failing to distinguish the phenomena that must be distinguished. I think it's pretty clear that these three properties, lack of clarity, vagueness, and confusion, are logically independent from one, from one another. Red square is a vague concept because it's vague, it's vague what is rare, but it's a clear concept. If something is a red square, it is red and it is square. If something is red and it's square, it is a red square. So red square is a clear concept, but it's definitely a vague concept because whether something is red is itself a vague matter. There are some shades such that it's indeterminate whether these shades are actually uh, are, oops, are actually uh, 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 red. Uh, so one way to think that group style concepts, uh, uh, good manian group style concepts can be clear, they can be precise. Um, um, so they can be clear, they can be sharp, you have to say, but it can be, but it's actually admirable that they are confused. They refer to two distinct phenomena, uh, at least across, across time. All right, so the, these uh, three uh, notions are logically independent. However, it's also interesting, possibly, that they tend to cluster with one another. Right. So we, we might have a situation where three logically different properties tend to happen together. So concepts that are vague tend to be unclear and tend to be confused and so on and so on and so forth. If, if that is the case, it's an interesting linguistic or conceptual phenomenon that calls for an, uh, uh, an explanation. All right, I'll leave it at that. Um, now, it's not clear, and again, as I mentioned earlier in this lecture, I'm really no scholar, I'm no historian or philosopher, and so I always read Canap with great pleasure, but it's not clear whether Canap thought that unclear, vague, and confused concepts are intrinsically deficient. Um, and at least Protento called for reform or for uh, engineering. So that's not, you know, reading, uh, uh, we're reading the chapter one of the Logical Foundation. It was just not, 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 not quite clear what was Canap's view on the matter. On the other hand, uh, in other work, it does seem to take properties of concepts such as clarity, uh, uh, sharpness, and uh, lack of confusion to be uh, virtues and things to be uh, valuable and to be looked for. So here are some um, uh, Two quotations uh, related to one another from uh, the Manifesto, the Scientific Conception of the World, uh, published by Canab and colleagues in 1929. The first quotation is about his take on science, the second quotation is about his take on philosophy. And here's what he says about science neatness and clarity are striven for, suggesting that clarity is actually uh, intrinsically valuable. And by neatness here, one might think it's synonymous for sharpness and dark distances and unfathomable depths rejected, so poetic. In science, there are no depths. There is surface everywhere. All experience forms a complex network, which cannot always be surveyed and can often be grasped on any part. So that's for science that suggests here that even as I said, it's not quite clear whether it can absolutely that clear vague and concepts are intricately deficient. It does seem to take, at least in some part of his work, 
um, a lack of vagueness, so uh, neatness and clarity to be uh, intrinsically valuable. And here, what he says about philosophy, the scientific world conception knows no unsolvable riddle, clarification of the traditional philosophical problems leads us uh, uh, partly to unmask them at, as pseudo problem and partly to transform them into empirical problems and thereby subject them to judgment of empirical science. So the task of the philosophical world lacks this clarification of problems. There too, even so, uh, one might interpret this quotation in many ways, it does seem that kind of text to be clarity of concepts to be intrinsically evaluated. And at least so as a result, give us a potential reason to conceptually reform unclear concepts. Now, Canab, of course, was not and is not the only one to hold uh, uh, such type of views. Now, there are variations about exactly the views people hold, but it's a very common idea that um, uh, uh, sharp, clear, and uh, non confused concepts are intrinsically valuable. Uh, Max Weber, early on in, the, uh, uh, in um, as a Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, expresses the view very clearly when he talks about ideal types. Here's a quotation from Weber the construction of sharp and unambiguous concepts, so unambiguous in contrast to what I've called confusion, sharp in contrast to what I've called uh, vagueness. Uh, relevant to the concrete individual viewpoint, whatever that means here, which directs our interest at any given time, affords the possibility of clearly realizing the limits of their validity. So one of the virtues and of sharp and unambiguous concept is to know when they apply and when they don't apply. A very similar idea, of course, is to be found in Popper's cri uh, relentless criticism of um, vague and imprecise scientific theories and vague and imprecise scientific concepts. Right? One of the beef that uh, Popper had against, for example, psychoanalysis is the idea that some of the key concepts of psychoanalysis can, uh, can always be modified, applied. They're so vague that the uh, domain of application uh, remains very unclear. And at the same time, of course, in a slightly, in a related uh, area of thought, Bridgman, when he defended operationalization, viewed operationalism, so operationalist standpoint, as one might say, viewed operationalization as a way to provide uh, uh, um, uh, a clear uh, concept. Here's what Bridgman says in the first chapter of the logic of modern physics. We must demand that the set of operations equivalent to any concept be a unique set. And for otherwise, there are possibilities of ambiguity, so confusion in practical applications, which we cannot admit. So that's really our, our, now the are differences that we're aware of between this plan, between the philosophical background of this idea. But I think it does suggest it's a common idea that there's something intrinsically valuable in the clarity, precision, and uh, sharpness of scientific concepts. It's also a plausible idea. Uh, that you know, having such concepts of clear, sharp, and non-confused or precise prevents fallacies of uh, sororities, fallacy of equivocation. It also prevents miscommunication, right? When a concept, for example, is going to be um, uh, confused or um, uh, ambiguous, people might understand different things by the use of a given concept. And something which is, of course, very important in Popper's way of thinking about the logic of science is that it allows for severe testing. Right? It allows for uh, determining, for putting together tests such that if the hypothesis is false, uh, the hypothesis will be falsified. A very concept actually stands the way of a severe testing of scientific hypotheses. So it's of course not an accident that leading philosophers of science in the first half, not all of them, obviously, as I'm sure uh, 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 you talked about this uh, morning following Nancy Stowe, but um, um, uh, it's not an accident that leading philosophers of science saw that uh, uh, sharpness, clarity, and precision are intrinsically valuable. And as a result, that um, um, imprecise or confused um, vague and unclear concepts are, uh, uh, are intrinsically deficient and potent to call for, call for uh, reform. All right, um, so the, uh, that was to uh, set up the Canadian ideal. Now, the Canadian ideal, uh, uh, um, in fact, stands in a really sharp contrast to the way sales works. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of the um, first half of the 20th century philosophy, but it's also the case that um, 
somehow <laughs> their, their, their theorization about cells often fits poorly with uh, uh, the way cells actually looks like. Um, what I first want to do is set aside uh, uh, an argument about why we should uh, uh, ignore or reject, at least ignore in some circumstances, conceptual engineering. And the argument here comes from the observation that whether or not uh, we should uh, engage in conceptual engineering depends on a cost-benefit type of argument. We should consider the benefits that emerge from uh, doing conceptual engineering, but also consider their costs. And one of the costs that's extremely important and that's often neglected are opportunity costs. What, what else we could have done if we had not engaged in conceptual engineering? And one might think that conceptual engineering of unclear, vague, and confused concept can be dismissed or set aside, however you would like to put it, on the ground that it comes with heavy opportunity costs. One finds this view well expressed in the autobiography of Francis Crick when he retroactively think about his epistemic situation um, uh, before the discovery of the double helix. Uh, Crick's notices that at the time, the concept of gene, that's a quotation at the bottom of your screen, the concept of gene was actually extremely unclear because there was a lot of uncertainties about gene's properties. But it's very clear in that autobiography that, is, that he thought at the time that it would have been a mistake to try to clarify the concepts of, of gene. And that the right thing is that at the frontier of science was just to get on onto the very specific task he was interested, namely what is the molecular structure that allows the duplication of, of, of genes across generations. And that we could just leave with a very unclear and confused and vague concept, and nonetheless try to solve that problem. Um, and that, in fact, trying to clarify the concept would have come with the, the opportunity cost of not getting on the work. As he says, I think, at the, at the, um, uh, I think in a fairly insightful manner at the end of the quotation at the bottom of your screen, in research, the front line is almost always in a fog. And I think that's something that. Uh, uh, historians of science uh, would agree uh, agree with. Now, I want to. I think uh, what I think um, uh, uh, Crick's or uh, Crick inspired point is definitely important. I want to set aside this consideration because dismissing or rejecting conceptual or setting aside conceptual engineering on such grounds is consistent with the recognition that lack of clarity, vagueness, and confusion are deficiencies, and that potential. Uh, such concept should be reformed. Potential such concept should be reformed, Crick might think, but everything else, everything considered, uh, uh, they should not, right? Uh, so what I want to be investigated is a more radical view uh, that, in fact, um, uh, an unclear, vague, and sorry, clear, uh, unclear, vague, and confused concept are actually not deficient concepts, right? Not simply that they are deficient, but that everything considered, they shouldn't be reformed. All right. Uh, so first step in the argument is going to be uh, is going to be that uh, many scientific concepts are actually unclear, vague, or confused. When one takes seriously the history of science, even of older science or contemporary science, there is no doubt that lack of clarity, vagueness, and confusion are often found in, in concept. There are numerous case studies in history and philosophy of science particularly in history and philosophy of biology, I should say. Uh, but the best worked out case studies, uh, case study remains the, the work done on the concept of gene. I think there's been a, 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 an extensive amount of work on um, uh, the concept of gene in the 20th century. And that's a wonderful case study for thinking about conceptual engineering. One of the classic book here is on your screen, the concept of the gene development and evolution edited by Burton, Falk, and Reinberger uh, in Berlin. Um, it's important also here to mention that it's not simply marginal concepts or concepts that have not been successful, that have these properties. The concept of gene really makes it clear that we're talking about central concept for whole research programs, indeed, for maybe the most, one of the maybe two or three most successful research programs in science in the 20th century. And uh, it's, it's pretty clear that the scientific uh, 
concept of gene is not a failed concept. It was part and parcel of uh, uh, maybe one of the two or three most successful research programs in the 20th century. So we're talking about central concept and uh, I think uh, successful concept. You know, so that's something that might be um, uh, questionable and we might come to that question in the q and Now the concept of gene has this interesting property to be vague, to be unclear and to be confused. So uh, that's a great example to uh, uh, illustrate the fact that scientific concepts can be vague and they're all confused. But this concept has three properties at the same time. It's vague for various reasons. Uh, one way to show its vagueness is uh, illustrated on the left part of your screen with the phenomenon of, um, 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 sorry, Transplicing. So transplicing is a form of uh, RNA uh, processing where what is known as the exon, namely the coding parts of the uh, 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 of the DNA, from two different RNA transcripts are joined together, and that raises the question. So what we have, we're going to have a different parts of. We're going to have a single part of. It it, it results in the following in the following two phenomena. We have a single part of DNA that results in two different protein structures. And we're gonna have uh, two different parts of the DNA that result in a single um, protein structure uh, after transplicing. Uh, so now the question is, um, how are we going to individuate genes? Uh, take the, the first phenomenon, we have uh, um, a single uh, a part of the DNA that, that results in two different functions. As it's one or two genes, how do we count them? As uh, 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 God really knows. Uh, and take now the case where we have two locally separated parts of DNA that result in a single, as I say here on the screen, we program uh, uh, RNA. Are those a single gene or not? God knew it. God really knows. Um, and that's one of the many examples where it's become very unclear uh, uh, where the vagueness of the concept of gene is revealed as soon as we dig into the details of uh, transcription in, in a cell. What about lack of clarity? Well, lack of, there's a lack of clarity. What follows from uh, 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 the claim or the proposition that something is a gene? Well, I think here the lack of clarity is well expressed by the quotation by as a historian of biology, uh, Ryan Berger, who quotes the scientist uh, uh, Andre Verve, a gene is a gene is a gene. Uh, uh, probably the most insightful claim about what genes are. But I think what uh, uh, Verve here is telling us, and what Ryan, Ryan Berger following uh, Verve is, 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 is telling us here, is that it's totally unclear what follows from the fact uh, that something is, is a gene. Um, you know, um, it's um, uh, really up for grabs. There is not any definite consequences uh, from, the, from, the, from applying the tag gene to any uh, stretch of DNA. All right. Um, and um, um, uh, for the confusion of the concept, here's the idea is that the notion, the concept of gene is going to be uh, really identifying different phenomena. And I think it's, I want to read the whole quotation for the sake of time on the right part of your screen. But what it shows is that different parts of uh, the biological community working with the concept of gene are focusing on what Weinberger called different epistemic objects different objects characterized with different properties. So molecular biologists, for example, and the evolutionary biologists are not going to be focusing on really the same type of entities when they use the same concept of, of, of genes. Things might, come, might be as a gene for one community and not for the others. So there is a confusion here about uh, what genes are. All right. There's much more to be said. There's a huge literature on, on the concept of gene. I mentioned the Reinberg book, but there's much more published, particularly in the context of Evo Devo uh, over the last uh, 20 years, particularly by uh, Pete, Pete Fox, um, like uh, Alan Love, for example. Now, at this point, it, it would be fair to say, okay, some scientific concepts are unclear, vague, and confused, but how many of them are? Maybe, despite their importance, it's only a handful of them 
um, um, I think the answer is that it's hard to say, but I think for a set of reasons, my, uh, my guess, and then we can come back to that question in the Q&A, is that in fact, many scientific concepts happen to uh, be uh, uh, vague, uh, opaque, and so vague, unclear, and uh, confused. All right, that was the first step of the argument. Uh, the second step of the argument is a little bit different. Uh, it's going to be uh, the claim that uh, these concepts are successful because they are unclear, vague, or confused. So the first step is that there are such, some scientific concepts are unclear, vague, and confused. So the concept is a causal claim. They are unclear because as they are successful because they are unclear, vague, or confused. Now, historians and philosophers of biology in particular have no doubt about these claims. Uh, they put it in print in uh, many different settings. So here I've given you a quotation from uh, Ryan Berger. For the sake of time, I will just read the last sentence uh, of this quotation. Ryan Berger notices that the concept of gene uh, uh, fails uh, any standard of rigor that uh, philosophers, we have to keep in mind, philosophers might impose on scientific concepts. And, and here's what he said, which is an extremely insightful uh, point. Let us take this as a lesson about the dynamics of science, instead of accusing the actors of being careless in defining the entities they work with. Careless in defining the entities they work with. Um, and he calls in that uh, uh, excellent uh, uh, chapter for an epistemology of imprecise concepts. Um, um, you know, as someone who's been prone in my past work to criticize scientists for using uh, confused concepts, uh, I, I'm, I'm actually particularly sensitive to this uh, 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 point. And uh, Neto, who I noticed was at his attending to the beginning of this lecture, if he has not left, make a very similar point about another scientific concept, namely the concept of biological lineage. Here's what he says at the end of this quotation, for the sake of time, I will not read it either. This case study also shows that even very imprecise concepts can be beneficial to scientific practice. So, science, so uh, history and philosophers of biology have no doubt. Now we have to dig to the, uh, in the case studies to really provide the uh, historical evidence supporting the causal claim. I uh, do not have years of time to uh, do it here. I refer you to the work of history and philosophers of biology. I'm reasonably convinced by the work they have uh, done, but nonetheless, let me just um, um, let me just uh, put put forward the following caveat. Well, I think the work is reasonably compelling. It's also hard not to feel that we often, at times, given some things that just look like just so stories about how the precision of such concepts of scientific concepts closely allows the fulfillment of scientific goals. You know, they're, they're making a guess with the historic evidence that often as good as it goes, but it's really, at the end of the day, uh, 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 just a just a story. And one uh, who would want to, define, to defend the Kardashian idea would might put the foot down here. Um, it's also, and as, as a result of um, the nature of the evidence that's provided, it's never quite clear whether the counterfactual, if this vague, un, um, uh, unclear, and obscure concept had been clear, sharp, and precise, the scientific goals would not have been fulfilled. Is true or even plausible, right? So I take I take this history for the personal biology to make a causal claim. So I take the following counterfactual to be true. If such concepts had been clear, sharp, and precise, the scientific goals would not have been fulfilled, and not have been fulfilled to the same extent. And reading the empirical literature, where I think it's not totally implausible that this counterfactual is true, I can't say that I'm fully, fully convinced just, just yet. Anyway, I'm going to take it for granted that the history and the personal biology have done uh, a reasonable job. I think a better type of evidence comes from, and that's one that Weinberger mentions in the chapter I've mentioned, comes from failed scientific reforms. So failed, failed cases of uh, conceptual engineering in, in science. So scientists trying to reform some scientific concept, to engineer some scientific concept in light of their lack of, uh, of their vagueness, lack of clarity and confusion, but failing to do so. Uh, a great example uh, is the work of Seymour Benzer on the concept of gene. So Benzer started with a view, which I think is just true, that the concept of gene, of, of gene is actually confused. 
It refers to various phenomena, uh, various units, the so units of heredity, the so units of expression, and the so units of function, uh, sorry, the so units of function, of recombination, and of mutation. So three different units that, are, uh, that can happen without uh, uh, one another, they are logically and empirically distinct. And he proposed to distinguish them and to introduce names or concepts referring to these three units, namely Sistron, Recon, and Merton, and Newton, sorry, uh, in, a paper, in a famous paper in 1955. And the fact is, this uh, work of procedural engineering was a total failure. It failed to, like, to catch on. The same is true of Gould's uh, and colleague's uh, suggestion to eliminate the notion of gene from um, um, uh, evolutionary biology in 1992. And the same, I'm sad to report, of my own <laughs> attempt at, uh, uh, at this eliminating, but this is conceptually engineering, the concept of concepts now 10 years ago. And despite uh, 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 the fact that this book has been widely read, the fact is psychologists haven't, haven't caught on, they haven't really been convinced about the need that uh, the I, I think I've convinced them that the concept of concept is actually confused, that it is about distinct phenomena, but I definitely have not convinced them that they should do something about it, and that they seem to be still very happy to uh, <laughs> uh, go on uh, and keep using the concept of concept. So there are tons of failed reforms, and a plausible, again, it's not, it's not a decisive case, but a plausible diagnosis of what's going on is that Look, scientists are aware of the confusion of the concepts they're using, and they're totally fine with it. And they're totally fine with it because um, these properties are not deficiencies of concepts. They're not, they don't make concepts intrinsically deficient. They actually are functional. Okay, what's the upshot? Uh, I've been going very fast. The case studies are fascinating. Uh, I, I, I invite you to have a look at them. It's unclear, vague, uh, unclear, vague, and confused scientific concept need not be deficient concepts. And unfortunately, uh, do not call for conceptual engineering, even potential. All right, uh, I'm running a little bit late. I've got four more minutes and two sections. So I'm okay. Uh, uh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel said I'm fine, but I, I will uh, try to uh, uh, pick up the pace a little bit. Uh, I can skip some slides in this section. All right. Now, the question is okay, there are scientific concepts can be unclear, they can be vague, and they can be uh, confused. And it's at least Arguable, I know, I think, as I said, the case is not quite there yet, but it's arguable that uh, these properties um, uh, allow for their scientific success. Now, the question is why? The question is not why some scientific concepts are unclear, vague, and confused. That would be a question for his historical gene conceptual gene genealogy, or maybe historical linguistics. It would be a matter of maybe a given concepts, precise concepts, and the way it gets to be used across discipline. So it's a slightly different question. The question here I'm asking is a functional question, is what's the point of having such concepts? Sorry. And the usual answer one gets from historian and philosopher of uh, biology is that those concepts are interfield concepts. They are concepts that are, are at the intersection of various scientific fields or research traditions. So unclear, vague, and confused concepts promote good science because they are interfield concepts. And the idea here is that they allow the flow of explanatory practices, methods, research questions, and so on and so forth across diverse fields. Each field provide, each field has a most precise, uh, less unclear or more clearer, and a less confused scientific concept. But the existence of uh, this, um, 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 this level of understanding of this concept that is uh, uh, unclear, vague, and confused allow for the flow of um, all these aspects of science across quite diverse parts of science. And that's an idea that one finds in uh, many places, very well expressed by uh, Ryan Berger, for example, here, which ties uh, the uh, um, vagueness and uh, confusion and um, uh, unclarity of the concept of gene to the fact that molecular biology is a hybrid science. And again, for the sake of time, I won't read the quotation here, 
But and he uses he uses the notion of a boundary object, it's quite metaphorical. But the idea here is that uh, uh, the concept of gene is used in very different uh, parts of science. In each part of science, the concept of gene gets to be, as it were, fleshed out by a set of theoretical and experimental practices. But if it was only uh, fleshed out, getting more precise, getting less unclear, clearer, and getting less confused, then the findings in one of these areas could not flow to the other parts of science. And the vagueness allows this, this transfer of information. Uh, uh, other historians and philosophers of biology have talked about the role of unclear, imprecise, uh, uh, unclear, vague, and confused concept for integrating various aspects of, of science. So that's a usual answer. And there, is, uh, uh, and there is no doubt that there is a truth in, in, in that. But I think uh, we should dig a little bit uh, deeper. I think the real source of the vagueness, lack of clarity, and confusion of interfield concepts is the following one, is that they are underspecified. So scientific concepts are vague, uh, unclear, and confused because they are underspecified. And by underspecification, uh, I mean the following, a concept is under specified if and only does not fully specify its condition of application. Uh, under specification is related, but it's not quite identical to Weissmann's notion of open texture, but I'll skip that for uh, the sake of time. Under specification explains why interfield concepts are, um, are uh, uh, vague, unclear and uh, confused to some degree. And that relates to the idea I formulated a little bit earlier. Each field of research tradition provides additional specification of the underspecified specified concepts. But by being formulated by means of underspecified concepts, the, find, the finding explanatory schemes and so on and so forth can be detached from their original settings and as a result exported across, across fields. And I think that to be uh, consonant with uh, Reinberger's original ideas and with the work of other history and philosophers of biology. And I mentioned Neto, who also talks about under specification here. Yeah. All right. The question then is why are scientific concepts under specified? And here's a, the main idea, uh, which I'm not the first one to have, of course, is that under specified concepts are flexible, right? So uh, under specification. Uh, allows for scientific concepts to be flexible. And the real flexibility here is, uh, the, uh, um, is the following one. They can be modified in light of scientific changes while preserving their identity, right? I think that, that's a crucial point. And because they can be um, um, uh, modified while preserving their identity, they, uh, they allow for the continuity of a research tradition to be maintained despite the constant uh, changes that are produced by the pace of science. And the changes are introduced by technical or technological sciences, by empirical discoveries, or by theoretical revolutions. What we can have is a continuity of a given research tradition, uh, despite uh, these uh, changes introduced by uh, the uh, uh, constant renewal that comes with science. So flexibility, modification with identity. That's, that's a crucial idea. That's what other specification allow. I think it's, it's, here it's really worth comparing this perspective uh, with Bridgman's take on, on, on the matter. Bridgman also starts, the whole work starts with the scientific revolution coming from Einstein. And uh, Bridgman also notes that what's characteristic of, of science is that the, as he says in the beginning of, of, of this section of the first chapter, new kinds of experience are always, always possible. Right? And he talks about the essential unpredictability of experiment beyond the present range. But Bridgman's reaction is the opposite of, of, of mine, or the opposite of, of Reinberger's and history and philosophers of science. He said, well, what we need is to regiment this concept as much as we can so that we can protect them from uh, such um, uh, unpredictability of scientific change. I think that's a wrong reaction. The right reaction is that concepts are underspecified just because scientific change is unpredictable and constantly happening. All right, uh, 
Worth noting here, but I won't make too much of that, is that flexibility, of course, is not only a property of the scientific lexicon. Many uh, lexical semanticists have argued, even since they argue about the semantic detail, they have argued that, in fact, uh, um, uh, the lexicon of natural languages is essentially flexible, in part due to uh, its under specification. And here's a quotation, as I skip it, from a, a, a Yai, Jayet, who is a French uh, linguist on under specification. All right. I'll take two minutes and then I'll stop. Um, so here, here where we are, scientific concepts are unclear, vague, and, 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 and um, uh, are obscure, at least often, that contribute to their epistemic success in science. Why is that? Because they are underspecified, and under specification gives them the flexibility. And I've mentioned that one piece of evidence for that was a failure of engineering. On the other hand, I think it's also worth noting that we have engineering tales of engineering success. And two, one of them here is on the screen, is the concept of Enzyme in a very important paper published in 1953, a great case of conceptual engineering. And another one more uh, recent is the concept of uh, homology. Um, and uh, in both cases, what we have is a regimentation of this concept, great example of conceptual engineering itself. So we are at this strange situation where on the one hand, I've given you argument for why conceptual engineering should be rare or fed, but on the other hand, we also have these nice examples of conceptual engineering. So the option here should be well, whether on this under specification of scientific concepts and deficiency depends on the research context. In some contexts uh, uh, under specified, so and as a result, vague and clear and confused concepts will be deficient. In other concepts, they won't. Uh, uh, um, and um, so in themselves, they are not, they don't make concepts deficient. They make concepts deficient in relation to a given scientific concept. Now, at this point, it's tempting to embrace the following Canadian norm. Scientific concepts should be clarified, sharpened, and specified to the extent that is appropriate in the relevant context. Now, that's a great norm. Uh, it's obviously very plausible in space, but it's pretty much useless. Uh, and I think it's useless because it's often opaque when context, when context calls for restricting the under specification. And I think the fact that we have all these attempts, some stick, some don't, really tells us that scientists are not very good at recognizing the right context. And uh, they're not very good because I think it's just opaque. Which context calls for engineering? All right, and we end up then with a sort of a new challenge to conceptual engineering. The usefulness of under specification is the opacity of context make it hard to know when one should conceptually engineer concept. All right, let me conclude. I'm already a bit over time. The lack of clarity, the vagueness, and obscurity are not necessary deficiencies of scientific concepts. They can be, I'm not denying that they can be, but I want to say that they, they are not necessary deficiencies of scientific concepts. When they are the expression of their under specification, I'm not saying that they are necessary the expression of such of under specification, I'm saying that they often are. And when they are, they contribute to the flexibility, the flexibility of scientific concepts, explain why they are epistemically successful. And this makes decisions about what calls for engineering or explication uncertain. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>